Thank you very much, and thank all of you for uh, attending the session, for hearing a little more about the clinical implications of antifungal resistance, which was my charge today for molds, as uh, for aspergillus mainly, but also other molds. Here are my disclosures here, and I will end up talking about several of the compounds uh, that you heard about earlier in, in, in the meeting uh, from the, uh, uh, the industry people themselves, and so I'll give my little uh, take on some of the, some of the uh, development that is ongoing. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, uh, here's a little road map of what we'll talk about today. Uh, obviously, I'll uh, deal a little bit with the extent of the problem. You've heard about some of it from Nathan, but obviously resistance is increasing in molds and I think has become a really important clinical uh, issue for all of us to consider. There is, though, a significant amount of local and geographic variability, which I'll highlight a little bit as well. Clinical outcomes are what I'll mostly focus on. The role for susceptibility and the guidelines uh, that, that recommend uh, approaches to use of susceptibility testing, and then implications in the management of our, our patients with these infections. And then finally, I'll, at the end, I will go through some of the management options and the new drugs in development. Really, it's a great time uh, for mold uh, therapies uh, being developed. As you've heard uh, earlier in the meeting, there would be times we would hardly talk about any uh, drugs being studied. And now there are a number of compounds that are actually beginning to enter clinical trials, and including one trial that I'll touch on at the very end, uh, dealing with strategies for optimizing outcomes. And I will say, if I don't touch on your favorite compound, it wasn't intentional. Uh, it was due to those time constraints that we are posed with, but we'll be able to discuss them in the, in the question and answer uh, period uh, that, that follow the session. Obviously, resistance in aspergillus has become a major issue worldwide. This slide highlights some of the development of that resistant profile across the world. Uh, Itraconazole resistance was first described uh, in the UK, actually from a patient in California, of course, uh, treated with long-term itraconazole, and it sort of made sense. If you treated patients for a long, long time, you would end up with resistance, and we all thought that would be what would occur. You can see in that top panel the rates of resistance described mostly molecularly by Dave Denning and his group, uh, but highlighted a really major problem. Subsequently, though, of course, uh, the global emergence of point mutations uh, with the tandem repeats in the promoter region that Nathan outlined earlier have really become uh, the major issue in aspergillus. The TR34 uh, first described and then TR46 with those mutations that were subsequently recognized. Those are due to probably environmental exposures to fungicides, and I'll highlight that a little bit on the next couple of slides. There are specific hotspot mutations that occur, and some other uh, mechanisms of resistance we still don't know, as Nathan has outlined. Some of these are pan-resistant to all antifungals, uh, pretty much, uh, for the azoles. Uh, others will be selective in the resistance profiles, so it makes looking at individual azole susceptibility, I think, work worthwhile in many of the patients that we approach. In uh, the fungus testing lab, the rates of azole resistance remain relatively low, even uh, with those, uh, those numbers that are shown there for breakpoints, if you will, for resistance, which is probably not true. Uh, in the sense that it hadn't really been uh, vetted and established as true breakpoints, but those are, pro are at least clinically relevant sort of numbers. The resistance, uh, the prevalence of azole resistance in the Netherlands, of course, became a major issue as described by Paul Ver Verweg and all the Dutch colleagues there, with rates rising from really minimal levels initially to more than 10 percent later on with high mortality in those patients. Obviously, you know this slide, but the global emergence of azole resistance has really uh, been the, the major feature now described really in, in most areas of the world. The mechanisms of azole resistance in, in, in the United States, though, have been looked at pretty extensively. These were the, the data that was the initial report that Nathan made uh, 
uh, he didn't really focus on that in his own talk, but he screened in the fungus testing lab isolates identified with an itraconazole screen uh, to highlight the possibility of resistance and then sequence those strains to see uh, what resistance mutations were present. In that process, he found two uh, TR34 isolates and two TR46 isolates, uh, which hadn't previously been found and at least one of which predated actually the uh, detection of the isolates in Europe. So it's been here a long time, it just hadn't been very prevalent. You can see though that the MICs are high with TR34, you usually see resistance, oh, oh sorry, uh, TR34 you see resistance really across the board for the azoles with high MICs. With TR46, you see higher MICs with VORI and ISAVU, uh, often with lower MICs to, to POSA, not very distinctive on that slide for those uh, initial isolates, but subsequent strains bear that out. These are the data uh, from Sean Lockhart and the group at the CDC that looked extensively for the environmental isolates in the U.S. and screened isolates in the CDC to collection for resistance as well. Uh, in this passive screen, initially, there were no uh, isolates in their, in their survey with TR34 or TR46 mutations. Subsequently, low rates of, of TR34 uh, have been discovered 1.4 percent, so it's clearly not a, a huge problem yet in the U.S. On the other hand, as Nathan alluded to, uh, in that study, they also looked in peanut farms, and basically in those farms, they used those azoles just as was described in the Dutch uh, uh, tulip fields uh, and, and in other parts of the world. In that setting, from the current crop, they didn't find any of those mutations, but in the compost heap of old uh, uh, crops where they basically had extensive amounts of fungicides uh, that were all in that, that compost material, they were able to detect a significant number of those isolates. I show that to suggest that clinically I think we have the potential for increasing numbers of these strains even here in the U.S. The clinical impact is shown then on the next few slides. I was first uh, uh, noted by Paul Verweg in this uh, short publication uh, to the New, New England Journal a number of years ago, which pointed out the clinical impact of these resistant isolates. And in this survey, you basically see in these small numbers of patients, these nine patients, only two of those patients actually died from infection. Subsequently, though, the Dutch colleagues, Van der Linden and others, reported the extent of infection, and they surveyed hematology units across the Netherlands and found various varying rates of disease in varying units. A message I think is important for you to know your local epidemiology, which would mean you need to do some susceptibilities. Uh, in that setting, though, they found detection of resistance using an itraconazole screen, again, in about 5% of the isolates, and confirmed a, a a TR34 clone in many of those patients with an overall patient prevalence of around 5%. You can see that the, the MICs here are really high. The first line there is the TR34 clone with high rates of itravori and, uh, and POSA not so significantly elevated there. <clears throat> the clinical impact though was really dramatic. 88% mortality or so in these patients. Here were the patients with invasive disease uh, where basically all but one of them died from infection, and many of them were treated initially with voriconazole as per guideline recommendations. Subsequent, subsequent surveys by that group and the publication in CID outlined again a new mutation, now the TR46 mutation that was described, not as common in nature, a 9 to 1 ratio favoring TR34, the patient ratio was about a four to one difference. They described in this publication 15 patients. Six of them were without really disease. They were colonized isolates, uh, presumably, uh, but five of the eight with invasive aspergillosis died uh, and persistent infection happened uh, in another two. Uh, those very small numbers, but four of the five treated with voriconazole died, whereas none of the three treated initially with liposomal amphotericin succumbed from infection. Uh, 
You can also see, though, again, very high MICs across the board in, in this setting. <clears throat> Another scenario that has become a significant problem in some areas, and I think it's probably un, under, under recognized in our own medical centers as well, and it's the uh, co-association of aspergillosis in patients with severe influenza. It's been m particularly reported by the Dutch group uh, and in their survey, basically, and this publication was just published recently in Lancet Respiratory Medicine, <clears throat> they found uh, over a seven-year period that, in, in, uh, that invasive aspergillosis was diagnosed in about 20% of the 400-some-odd patients admitted to ICU with serious uh, in, uh, influenza. In those patients who were immunocompromised, who otherwise had risk factors, for invasive aspergillosis, the rate was even higher, around 30 percent, about a third of them. In the non-immunocompromised patients <clears throat> with influenza, only about 14 percent. But the control group, <clears throat> really, they still see aspergillus in a significant number of ICU patients, around 5 percent. I don't know that we see that, that much in our own ICUs, but that is what's been reported in, in that region of the world. <clears throat> Previously, it was thought that invasive aspergillosis was, was most associated with H1N1, influenza A. That association is not as solid as it seemed to be and may be associated uh, with influenza B uh, in pretty much equal amounts. To tie this back to our resistance theme of this, this lecture, though, resistant aspergillus, again, happened in a, about a quarter of those patients. Small numbers of those had cultures done. So you might even presume higher rates overall. The mortality rate was extremely high, about 50% of those patients with influenza with aspergillosis, <clears throat> excuse me, versus less than 30% in those patients without invasive aspergillosis, without uh, aspergillosis. <clears throat> so risk factors obviously included influenza, sicker patients, steroids, and the like. But I really highlight it to say, think not only the possibility of invasive aspergillosis in this flu season coming up, but the potential for resistant disease uh, as, as well, depending on your local epidemiology. Well, what about susceptibility? This has been one area of the IDSA guidelines, which I was part of, that we <clears throat> have received some feedback, we'll say. Uh, and here were the recommendations. Were, was, our recommendation was that routine antifungal susceptibility uh, was not recommended, at least as an initial approach, uh, but recognized that susceptibility testing uh, using reference methods was necessary in patients that you suspected as having a resistant, resistant isolate, those who were unresponsive, and certainly for epidemiologic purposes. And the rationale was pretty, I think, straightforward. Lower rates of resistance are reported in the U.S. Frankly, it's often hard to get a culture at all. And just getting a culture and identifying the, the organism to a species level, we th felt was probably a more important use of resources overall. And, and as Nathan highlighted, many labs locally don't do uh, testing in their own centers, send it at, at, out as a send, send out test so it doesn't impact initial therapies. And frankly, the clinical correlation, while increasing now, I think, since that publication, still relies a lot on expert opinion and the data are somewhat limited. On the other hand, there's significant harms in, in the misdetection of resistance, as I think I've highlighted. The approach and the uh, ECMID, uh, uh, the, the ESMID guidelines, the ECCM ERS guidelines uh, published this year are a little different. I don't think they're that dramatically different. Uh, they're based, I think, in part on this expert panel that some of you are, were part of. It was basically a group that got together and suggested uh, the importance as sort of a guidance, more than a guideline, to establish microbiologic diagnoses, identify uh, the species a complex the, uh, level of, of the organisms, and in areas with high rates of resistance to more than 10 percent, to test all isolates for susceptibility. The reliability, I think, of azole-based auger screen as initial approach. It's something we don't do very much in the U.S., but it may be a way to screen for resistance. Obviously, reporting results quickly is important. Testing multiple isolates, I think, is a little more questionable and probably difficult to do. And there were, that read, led to the ESMID guidelines, 
uh, ECMID uh, ECCM guidelines is outlined, which basically says that antifungal susceptibility testing should be performed uh, in those regions where, where resistance occurs uh, or if you suspect resistance. One thing that Lewis, I think, mentioned uh, somewhat, but I think an, an intriguing notion is PCR-based detection of resistance. This highlights one method. There are local uh, methods that are available, but others, uh, commercial kits as well. This is simply one of them, the Aspergenius assay. But it basically allows detection of four mutations that would then encompass TR34, and those last two mutations, T289 and Y121, are the, are the mutations associated with TR46. So it, put, uh, it would pick up uh, all those, those strains. And doing that approach basically uh, detected more of these tandem uh, repeat or RAMs uh, resistance mutations. And clear, the numbers are small, but in that setting, azole failures were much more common when those were detected. And mortality was higher as well. So I think it does have significant clinical implications. The ESMID guidelines do highlight the importance of why to test and what the, the intention would be, uh, and obviously what the interventions would be. They suggest that in those patients with uh, voriconazole MICs that are elevated over two, uh -oh, that you would basically approach those patients differently, either with at two to consider maybe combinations or liposomal therapy, uh, whereas higher than two, liposomal therapy is, seems like a more reasonable option. Well, let me turn in the last few minutes just to kind of quickly go over some of the clinical trials that are undergoing development uh, or in progress. And this is a trial that we hadn't talked about yet at this meeting. It's one that's ongoing. Many of you, I'm sure, are participating in. Uh, it's the uh, ongoing Merck trial of posiconazole compared to voriconazole for patients with proven, probable, or possible invasive aspergillosis. Uh, the primary endpoint of that trial is all-cause all mortality at 6 and 12 weeks. Uh, but it obviously has another important, a number of other important endpoints, including the safety of posiconazole compared to VORI, uh, but also a, a number of other issues, including su the role of susceptibility testing. Uh, these data uh, were provided by Hetty Waskin, uh, but uh, it highlights some of the challenges, I think, of these trials. This trial uh, done globally in many sites uh, began uh, enrollment in October 2013. That was several years ago, you may note. Uh, and as of five years later, had enrolled about 85% of the 600 patients that are targeted. Many of them are high risk. And you'll see impressively, a lot of the patients have proven or probable disease. So I think these are results we'll all be interested in and will certainly impact our practice regardless of what the results end up being. As I mentioned at the onset, there are a number of trials and drugs with activity that are, are in progress or planned. Uh, Rezafundin, uh, previously CD101, being developed by Sadara. The novel uh, Kinocandin that has really uh, very high levels uh, allows also once weekly dosing, which is an attractive option for therapy as well as prophylaxis. Uh, the, these agents uh, have activities similar to other echinocandins, perhaps will target resistant organisms as well with those high levels. It does have, have activity against Candida auris, which I won't focus on today, of course, but you heard about the other night. Uh, aspergillus activity, though, does include azole resistant strains, and a phase two trial uh, with Canada has been completed. Uh, if you look at this slide, uh, the activity of resifungin against aspergillus, including uh, resistant isolates and cryptic species that Nathan had mentioned earlier. These are data that he published uh, in Jack earlier uh, this year or just a month or so ago. But you see here in the middle uh, is the azole resistant uh, fumigata strains. And you see with resifungin here, very low MICs there but also some of these cryptic species that Nathan had highlighted, uh, Aspergillus colatoeustis, which is really very resistant to most antifungals, had really low MIC, or MECs, I should say, for the echinocandin-like drugs, uh, as well as these other cryptic species as well. A phase three a clinical trial is planned. It's called RESPECT. Uh, 
Uh, it's basically using resifungin versus uh, standard antimicrobial regimens to prevent invasive fungal infection. So it's a prevention trial. But this study is, I think, kind of interesting. It basically takes advantage of the echinocandin activity against pneumocystis as well. And, and so those patients, it could then supplant the use of Bactrim as well. Uh, and so it'll be an interesting trial uh, moving ahead. Uh, I, I was glad to know how to say Ibra, 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 no, tell it. Ibrexa. Ibrexa, Ibrexa. <laughs> I know I couldn't say that other one, Ibrexa fungerp. Uh, Ibrexa, Ibrexa, I'm gonna get that in my mind. Okay, so you've heard about it uh, from uh, the Synexis folks the other night. I think a very intriguing compound as well. Uh, has undergone uh, a, a lot of pre, uh, early studies. Phase one and two studies have been generally well tolerated. Two trials are ongoing, one for ARIS called the CARES trial. Another one for, re uh oh, it seems like I don't have good sense. Oh, there we go. Um, the uh, other trial is called FURI, which does allow resistant or unresponsive molds to be entered as well. Uh, uh, it basically has the same target as you heard as the econocandin, but a new class of drugs, a new molecular class, orally bioavailable, which is, I think, an attractive option. For uh, Brexa against aspergillus is shown here. Uh, you can see the MECs, again, really are very low. And a number of studies that I won't go into detail, but Mahmoud and Tom Waltz's group have both done. They're really kind of attractive. I'll point you to those studies. Uh, in vitro, you can see in combination, Abraxa uh, with Vori, Isa, or Amphotericin showed synergistic activity uh, against uh, a lot of asper aspergillus isolates. And combination therapy in a rabbit model with isocyfuconazole was also very effective, including the suppression of galactomanan. So I think very attractive and preclinical activity. And a study uh, appropriately for Synexis called Synergia uh, looks at basically the synergistic activity of Abrexa uh, with Vori. Uh, and so it'll be a, a trial with Vori plus Abrexa or Vori uh, alone. So that's uh, uh, beginning to be developed. You heard from John Rex extensively about uh, Lorifem. Uh, took me a while to be able to say that one too. Uh, but uh, a compound developed by F2G uh, inhibits uh, an enzyme in pyrimidine biosynthesis with really a big spectrum of activity, including that against some really resistant molds like Lamentospora, Scatosporium, and re the resistant Aspergillus. Uh, in vitro, uh, the MICs for Alorafem were really very low. Uh, resistance hadn't been seen, and cross-resistance doesn't seem to occur. There are limitations to everything, of course. Uh, the, the activity against Fusarium would, would, as you heard from Nathan, we'd love to have really high activity. Uh, little or no activity against mucoralis and not a yeast drug at all. Uh, but it does have excellent activity against uh, some endemics, including coccidioidomycoses, uh, which uh, we looked at in our animal models with really extensive in vivo activity. Uh, it does have activity against resistant aspergillus in animal models, and clinical trials are now uh, being are open for a salvage study, and other trials uh, will will follow. So, I think it is an option that's actively available for those patients with really resistant disease like Lomentospora that you've heard about in these posters as well that are, have, are really common in some of your centers. A couple of last slides, uh, the Amplex drug, uh, previously uh, de developed by ESI that called E1210, has good activity against many uh, species. You see, again, very low MICs, including that for Fusarium and Scatosporium uh, as listed. Uh, in vivo, uh, studies by us and others have looked at this compound in Canada, Aspergillus, and Fusarium with good results as shown. Uh, it has activity against uh, resistant uh, uh, albicans as well as uh, Canada auris. Uh, uh, and phase two trials for Canada as well as moles are in development. The Vical compound, again, a citrophore transport mechanism related uh, uh, activity uh, is called v VL2397. Activity uh, shown here against m many species of Aspergillus, uh, including re resistant strains. In animal models, activity have, has been good. 
and clinical trials are open. You heard about an investigator meeting uh, being planned for today. And then to sum up with a couple of last slides, this one uh, by uh, Biomet VT1598, you also heard about the other night. Uh, this compound uh, does have good activity against molds like Aspergillus, uh, Fumigatus, and also non-Fumigatus species, as you can see down here. Uh, it does have a broad spectrum of activity, uh, although clinical trials for Aspergillus are not currently in, in the works. Uh, and then one by to Toyama, the 2307, you heard about yesterday in the Canada discussions, a drug with pentamidine-like properties uh, acts against mitochondria, but really a broad spectrum, including many yeast and molds, but also pneumocystis. Here's some MICs that are shown, uh, and you can see against Fumigatus, the MICs are not as great. It's probably more of a resistant uh, a, a Canada drug with azole resistance, but Canada ORS2 with really low MICs. Uh, so, but I think activity is present for many uh, species, including Aspergillus terius, you see there with low MICs o over, overall. Uh, so a particularly attractive uh, option in terms of resistant species. In vivo, we've looked at the drug uh, in a number of settings, including Canada auris. Uh, but you can see activity against Canada, crypto, and Aspergillus as, as shown. <coughs> and then the last slide is another clinical trial. It's clinicaltrials.gov number is listed there. But I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, and just to sum up, luckily I was looking this way and didn't see any of those signs. Uh, but I see them now. Uh, the last slide is here, and it's Hard for you to see, uh, it's published in Mycoses earlier this year, but it was basically a survey done by Dutch uh, investigators looking at hematology units, and they wanted to standardize their approaches uh, to look at outcomes in resistant aspergillus. So they took at the top a CT with a patient at risk, they start therapy, do a BAL uh, therapy with an azole. Uh, they, in a galactomanan positive situation, shown on this side of the tree, then they do PCR in cultures, uh, on the right, with a negative uh, galactomanan, you basically also try for PCR. You then think about non aspergillus situations and give probably liposomal therapy in higher doses. Uh, in the galactomanan positive arm, if the PCR is positive, then for those resistant mutations, you probably then quickly transition to liposomal amphotericin. Uh, in those patients with wild type strains, then you continue your azole therapy. In those with negative PCRs or PCRs that you really weren't successful doing, if your prevalence is low, you can then continue the azoles. If the prevalence is high, the standardized approach will be basically to transition over to liposomal amphotericin. And then the part I don't show you is the follow-up, which they also look at. So it'll be a clinical trial uh, to then assess in a number of patients' outcomes in a standardized way. Uh, so I think it will help give us some useful information about what approaches really should be. So the extent of problem will vary a lot in different centers. I think the role for susceptibility is increasing. There are a number of new strategies and new management options. And with that, I will recognize the zero and stop. Thanks so much for your attention. Thanks. Okay, we have uh, three minutes for uh, questions. Um, Everybody has been very quiet. It's fascinating. Lewis has a question. Anyone? They okay. are. Everybody's oh, wore right. out. Yeah. Pete has worn everybody out. It's more point in the flow diagram you showed from the Dutch and how it applies to the hematology patients. And I think there's a sort of a call to sort of put that approach to the post influenza aspergillosis as well because it's quite difficult to diagnose and your patients are not your typical patients. You know, we had a case earlier this year which was um, a gentleman had flu, two weeks later still sort of improved a little bit, but then really bad respiratory symptoms. And he was a homosexual gentleman, so we were convinced he was HIV positive. HIV, HIV tests were coming back consistently negative. BTD glucan was greater than 500. So we were convinced that he had pneumocystis. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't then until we did a BAL and the galactoman on that was strongly positive that we thought, actually, we've got post-flu aspergillosis. And the risk factors were basically just the steroids. 
and there was nothing else in there that, that we would have thought that you had aspergillosis. And I think there's an increase in post-flu aspergillosis occurring, likely to see uh, in correlation with the increased number of flu cases we're seeing yeah, yeah. in the last couple of years. And so we need the diagnostics, if not just to get the culture, if you've got a BAL, you can then do the PCR to determine the resistance markers. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point. I, that's why I was kind of intrigued with their, their sort of agreeing on a standardized approach, because I think we do significantly underdiagnose a m number of our patients simply because we don't have a standardized approach. You guys are the fungal people, so you know these sort of approaches, but I think all of you deal with your colleagues at home who, who don't, and then it becomes a particularly problematic issue. I think it's well taken. Tom, I have a question relating to the clinical part of the talk. And for a long time, I didn't believe this aspergillus uh, influenza stuff because we just weren't seeing it. And, the, and it, was, it seemed like it was limited to Europe. Well, we saw two cases this year, and it was, it was <clears throat> dramatic. It was really dramatic. One was in a pregnant woman, mm -hmm. and her, her airways were just lined with mold. Um, the other one was a heavy smoker. And it, it makes me wonder, um, what do you think the link is? You, I mean, I, I, my perception is that Europeans smoke more than Americans <laughs> do now. Um, and and, and I, I really do wonder if it's, I mean, assuming that the virus is the same, yeah. um, what do you think it is that, that uh, has led them to diagnose us much more frequently than, than we have? Because we really haven't, we haven't recognized this at all and, and until yeah. very recently. So yeah, what, do you, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. We don't, I, but our experience was the same. That's really why I threw that in here, because we're coming up to flu season, and I think that we underdiagnosed that a lot. We also saw a couple of really dramatic cases, uh, which were really extensive and just weren't expected at all. Uh, I do think prior lung disease is a risk factor, and smoking <laughs> may be seriously one of the risk factors. But I, I really encourage you to keep it in your, un, in your radar. May I briefly yeah, comment yeah. on that from the Netherlands? Uh, uh, Barjan is, is part of this study group, uh, in the, the Dutch Belgium um, group. Uh, multivariate analysis, which was just uh, published uh, two months ago, yep. smoking was not a risk factor. Uh, steroids are, um, it's a very, early disease, people come in yeah. with their combined influenza and invasive aspergillosis. If you BAL them on the day of admission, you find sky-high um, BAL galaxomanins, and they will die within a few days. Um, so probably the, um, the diagnosis is missed very often. Um, it might be um, that the uh, neuraminidase inhibitors um, affect the host defense against uh, uh, aspergillosis. Yeah. So uh, it, it, oseltamivir may be a causative factor, uh, but that's, that's it's being studied. Yeah, Hong so, next, and then, then Ramud. So actually, um, if you look at the literature, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, say it. Yeah. If you look at the literature from the New England Journal of Medicine back in, uh, uh, in 1980s, in the mid-1980s, like uh, uh, Aspergillus was one of the few organisms besides Schrepnumo and Staph aureus uh, diagnosed after influenza. Uh, yeah. yes. uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, what we have been seeing a lot is because uh, we are ECMO center, so all of these uh, patients with severe influenza are put on ECMO, and you just see like uh, the biphasic. Yeah. So these are uh, super infection. Uh, after after influenza, and uh, the study that have been published from PIT so far is that when we did this silex assay that look at the T cell function, yeah. all of the, those uh, patients either are lymphopenic or the silex assay was, was severely uh, abnormal. And another, our CCM colleagues have been looking at the cytokine before, like mm -hmm. a serial cytokine during the the ECMO. Uh, uh, there was a phase of hypocytokinemia, and after that, the pa patient was just hypocytokinemia, and those were associated with aspergillus, either colonization or disease. Uh, 
And most of them, you know, we saw like a, a tracheal bronchitis. Yes. Um, yes, I was going to mention that. So tracheal bronchitis is really significant, but I think we all obviously think staph aureus, but I just think aspergillus is a lot more common in this scenario. Mahmoud? So I want to talk about the guidelines with regard to doing antifungal susceptibility for isolates that when you, somebody basically fails or something happens. I really think, taking into consideration the uh, patient and the outcome, like when you find, especially in cases which is resistant, the high level of mortality, like four out of five, let's say, in the voriconazole arm, I really think we should reconsider this because we do the same with the candida, which yeah. I, maybe, maybe, you know, uh, we've been doing that. Don't do it except in uh, this case. Two things b bad about that, because then physicians don't think about that, and then they don't do susceptibility yes. testing even when, when it happens. So I really think we should uh, reconsider this as a... Yeah, so I think it was pretty uh, transparent of me to bring that up uh, in the talk. Uh, I think so, too. Uh, I agree with you that I really think the pitch for local susceptibility, even screening with a, an itraconazole screen or with a uh, three azole screen and controls, there's a, several that are being marketed now. I think the VIP check was one of the names. Uh, hardly used at all in the U.S. But I think as those become more available and I think as our rates increase, it's going to be really important to do. I think we do say do susceptibility if you are concerned about resistance, uh, but really most of these patients don't see azoles before they present with resistant strains. So I think your concern for resistance needs, just like your recognition for aspergillus and flu, needs to be bigger. Uh, your concern for resistance needs to be in almost everybody. And really, this is the, uh, maybe as a PhD I'm talking about MDs, it's not appropriate, but the, uh, the clinic, clinicians don't tend to think about this. Like, in, yes. for example, in derm dermatology, which is, I think it's, uh, it applies to, they just think, okay, this is the situation, I know the disease and whatever. I think it will be very helpful if we have that as a practice. Understand? Well, and just briefly, I think now that we have a lot of options available and coming, it really makes it prudent to consider uh, options for therapy. So Tom and then Demetrius, quick Tom and then quick, yeah, tell Tom first. With regard to the smoking component, I think we also, in influenza, uh, there are a couple of other elements that one has to consider. We have three children, for example, ages 8, 10, and 15, who in the H1N1 uh, outbreak developed um, very severe pulmonary aspergillosis. Only one had received corticosteroids. The common element was, it was severe influenza. Of note, there's been extensive work done at St. Jude looking at the immunosuppressive effect of influenza, particularly mm -hmm. on um, Treg cells and, t and yeah. upregulation of Th2 uh, phenotype. So we may be looking at an immune dysregulation in addition to severe mucosal disruption, right. which can really tip the balance, especially if there's an exposure. I agree with you. I think, and it kind of ties into Hong's point, you know, that obviously I think the immune part, just like we thought with like CMV and aspergillus, mm -hmm. I think flu is just a really important uh, risk factor. Yep. Yeah. Um, we will present this data next week in ID week, but we look into uh, aspergillosis at MD Anderson post uh, respiratory viruses, RSV, oh, para influenza yeah. 3, and influenza. And uh, some people are going to be made not to be forgotten. First of all, we have a practice. Everybody who comes with upper respiratory infection due to influenza or um, RSV, not para influenza, is to be put on mold active prophylaxis because it's very well known. This has been described even before uh, the Dutch. Uh, uh, very well put uh, together, but not to be forgotten, what we found in this experience, the 42-day mortality, and we did a case control study with aspergillosis without prior influenza. What was amazing is 44% of our aspergillosis cases at MD Anderson post allo BMT follow respiratory viruses. Really? Huh. It's a very big, and here the question is, also the immune dysregulation, local and systemic, and underlying boop, something that we can yep, talk about yep. some other time. But the most virulent and the most poor progressive factor was RSV. RSV is much more worse than influenza, and with influenza, the, difficult, the difficulty to study is seasonal variations in virulence, how much the vaccine works. It's a very complicated question, but RSV is the big player also, 
Uh, that's something that uh, the community should focus a little bit post RSV as per zilosis, para influenza 3, a very virulent virus. But in our experience, if we start mold active prophylaxis, and we've been doing that for the last 15 years, the outcome doesn't seem to be worse than influenza negative as per zilosis in the allo BMT. I see you as a different yeah. story yeah. altogether. Interesting. Actually, the, uh, now that we have respiratory panel uh, diagnostics by PCR, I think it really makes it a, you, possible to look at some of those those factors. And then Bart Jan also had told me that actually a trial is beginning in the Netherlands to look at uh, prophylaxis uh, in, with posaconazole in those patients admitted to ICU with severe flu to see if it reduced the rate of disease. So I think it'll be a really interesting result as well. Thanks so much for your participation and time for the vote. Yep. Hey, I'm, not, I'm not the moderator here. It's now time for a break and we um, come back at 10.30.